Welcome to the Radio of Horror show here on WCUW. Tonight on the show with us, we have a distinguished uh, artist on the show with us from the science fiction fantasy world, a painter, Bob Uggleton. Thank you for coming on the show with us, Bob. Hey, no problem. Good to be here. <clears throat> um, Bob, your career, what, goes back to the, the 80s, the 70s? Yeah. Is that when you got started? Uh, well, probably, I, I would say, fairly to say, um, 1983 that's kind of when i really started uh you know things moving along i think a lot of people probably um younger people today mostly know you from your idw godzilla uh covers yeah. and such that's yeah, probably yeah, been yeah. your big uh modern day boom huh yeah i mean it's still i mean i'm, I'm coming up next year i'll be 40 years at this which has been really something i mean i've been able to do what i do for 40 years you know and 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 uh it's just been it's been interesting it's been very interesting time it's a lot of a lot of a lot of thought in retrospect there going back what was the first godzilla movie you ever saw oh boy the first one i ever saw well the first introduction to godzilla was not godzilla it was the godzilla game by ideal my mother bought it for me at a local store and she liked it because it had a dinosaur on it. And she knows into dinosaurs. And this was about 1966. And I get so enamored with the box artwork, I wanted to find out who this Godzilla was. And my first kaiju movie I ever saw was Gorgo, believe it or not. The British answer to Godzilla, but then that was the first one I ever saw. But Godzilla a movie, uh, the first one I ever saw was probably 1969 or 1970. I saw King Kong versus Godzilla because at the time... They had these little mom and pop theaters and small. We didn't have VHS. We didn't have DVDs. We didn't have any of that. So they had these little mom and pop theaters. And what they would do on weekends is they would run for a dollar or 50 cents or whatever. They'd show old movies like and call them kids matinees. And, you know, if you got on a lucky weekend, it was a Godzilla. It was like King Kong versus Godzilla, Godzilla versus the thing, uh, destroy all the monsters, that sort of thing. And, um, yeah, it's been it's been a really uh, 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 it's it was interesting. But the, my first thing was probably King Kong versus Godzilla, and then of course I caught up with uh, Channel Seven in Boston at the time had like a Sunday afternoon movie, and they had Godzilla, King of the Monsters, for the old. And so I said, "Oh, I got to see the first one." So the first one, you know, that was there was, and uh, you know, I sort of I I got onto it ever since, and the next one I think was probably I think I saw was Monster Zero, and then the next one I think I saw was Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, and and uh, it all sort of was uh, really good. It was um, sort of like you know <clears throat> in the early seventies. That's that's how we had to see things. So just if it came to the theater, or if it came on TV, you had to go scan the TV guide. You know, this Godzilla game you mentioned, I have seen this before, but I have never played it. It's got like a yellow board, like a zigzagging kind of yeah. crossover. Oh, so, it's so basic. But what it's funny is that it's made for kids. And, you know, you step on one of his red footprints and you get radiation burns. And you've got to go to the hospital. I mean, they, they made that for kids, you know what I mean? <laughs> and and um, and basically it's a it's a simple board game. It's one of the simplest board games you could actually imagine playing. And, and uh, um, you know, that sort of thing. It does look very simple. I don't know if you've seen the more modern day Godzilla game that's come out in the last couple of years. It's like it's got like oh. plastic figurines that look like the monsters, and it's, oh. it's a really elaborate board. I've I've got both of them. Uh, Funko Pop, I think, put that out, and then uh, another one, uh, a company along with um, I think it's Hasbro or whoever they they put out Godzilla Monopoly. So so um, that's out too. You know, there's that too. Um, yeah, and, my I got I got the Godzilla Monopoly for my son for Christmas a couple of years ago. Yeah, and and uh, that was that was that was it was fun. It was like um, uh, now now I, I grabbed one at one point and now I hear it's hard to get or something like that. So so uh, I, I you know yeah I mean I I sort of have all and then in the seventies they had a they had a couple of they had a Godzilla game called um, Godzilla versus Tricephalophon. And it was this, you had two cool figures. You had these kind of like this green Godzilla figure that looked a lot like the cartoon version of him. And um, and then you had this other three-headed thing called Tricephalophon. And, um, and then there was another one on top of that because so there, was, there was a Mattel Toys 
it was all Mattel was putting out this Godzilla boom. They had they had the license to do some Godzilla stuff. So that was like 1978, and uh, and that was because it was very po- it was very popular in theaters and stuff like that. Where did you um, where'd you go to school to uh, learn to be a you know a painter? You're uh, oh. you do everything by paint, right? Do you do anything by hand? I, uh, oh yeah, I do. I, I do. I do a lot of drawing. I do a ton of drawing. I like drawing better than painting, actually. Believe it or not. Um, today I spent drawing. I was drawing something, you know. Um, and um, my my favorite tool is a pencil. You know what I mean? It's like you can upgrade it by just putting it in a sharpener. Um, and uh, it's it's uh, fun to work with. I mean, I like working around with um, these things and and paint. I got into because I had to do that's what they needed for book covers and stuff like that. So I learned to paint a lot on these, or I learned to apply the fine art painting that I was doing and then applied it in a commercial way. And uh, it was fun to do. It was a lot of fun to do um, because I, I uh, you know, uh, I've been doing this for quite some time, and uh, you know, I, um, you know, it's 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 um, I, I'm still still at it. I just. I don't have the energy I had. I'm 61. I don't have the energy I had when I was like, say, 30 or or 35 or whatever. I just don't have the energy anymore. So, so I've been a little dealing with a little bit of those things too. You know, you painted like everything. It seems from um, you know monsters to uh, dragons and and vampires. There's one in particular that stood out to me, and I didn't even know it was you. Um, but I didn't realize how often your artwork appeared on book covers for '80s and '90s horror novels. There was one of a pumpkin biting into the top of a banister. Oh, it was Lisa Cantrell. It's called The Mance, and that was a fun book. Um, Lisa was a um, is she's a she's still around somewhere. I haven't heard from her in years. She was a writer and she was kind of a uh, half partner in a construction company or something in, I want to say, North Carolina. And she was a writer and she um, wrote her first book and her agent got it to tour books. And it was, they kind of said, well, you know, can I get Bob to do the cover? And I was like, they, it was my first horror cover. So Melissa Ann Singer, who at the time was editing Tours Horror Line, she really persuaded them to say, well, I, I really want Bob, Bob to do this cover. So I did it. And it sold zillions of copies. I mean, it sold a boatload of copies. And um, she, they, they pay attention to that kind of thing. So Lisa got a contract to do three more books. And I did the covers on, on two of them anyway. And I don't think they did as well. And I don't know what's become of Lisa lately. I don't know where she is, but she's... Uh, um, she's uh, I don't know where she is right now, but she's uh, she's around. But but the books are still. It's kind of an iconic piece, and, and it was like it was fun. It was really out of the blue for me. It was like I, I, they said, "Oh, you know." She told me the description. I said, "You know what would be kind of cool is do this evil pumpkin." You know, and I don't know what made me think up the idea that I did, but I did it, and I just got it out, and they loved it. I mean, they 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 loved it. They really went big with it on advertising, and you could do that back then. And so the book sold a lot of copies. It was it was embossed, which was really really something when you see a book cover that's got like embossing on it, you know. So um, yeah, they 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 did a, re- a real good job on that one. And uh, and yeah, it's 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 it, that comes back. That's that. It's funny that that cover's been coming back to me like in recent years. Like people saying, "Oh, you, you're the guy that did the mans," you know, like, "Oh yeah," or pops up on Facebook or some you know horror you know page like horror art of the '80s. And so he's like, wow, who did that? You know, and it's like, well, you know, and I had to chip in saying, I did that, you know, (laughs) so. Yeah, I think, uh, God, I think I was 12 years old. Yeah, I must have been like 12 years old when I first saw that cover. And I was like, oh, my God, what is this book? I don't care. I just want to read it because the cover. Yeah. Well, that's what we hope for. You know what I mean? And that's that's what it did. And it sold a lot of copies. And uh yeah, so that's that's a good thing. And then they, she did a sequel. And the sequel was the sequel was um, it wasn't as well received as the first one was. And uh, Lisa kind of retreated from the whole scene. She was very active in the horror writers of America and all that. And then she just, whatever reason, I, I I don't know. I haven't heard. I personally haven't heard from her literally in about thirty years. So oh my so god! I, but she's still around. I know she's still around. And. I'd um, love to talk to her because I love that book. But if she's yeah. like kind of reclusing herself from the entire industry, I totally get it. 
yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know what's up with that. I, I, I don't ask. You know, it's just one of those things where I, I hear things. You know, I could make theories up, but you know, it, it's probably, you know, I'd probably be, you know, and it's just, it's just whatever her personal reasons were. I don't know. I don't know what, what happened. So, the, um, the, the, the other book series that I really, I, I that's when I really started to get to getting to know who you were. Was the, um, what's the, the? Oh shoot, I just had it. The vampire series. Necroscope. Oh, necroscope. Yeah, that was that still continues to this day in the sense the legacy of it. Uh, uh, Brian doesn't really write it anymore, uh, but but the legacy of it is still there, and um, I'm I'm really impressed with how uh, the fans to this day come back and they talk to me and they tell me that 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 series like there's whole Facebook pages where it's it's like a an entire cult. I mean, everybody loves it and. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, and in fact, I've just got a piece. A, 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 I'm part of a high-end magazine slash fanzine called Phantasmagoria in the UK, and uh, there's an interview with me, some art by me, and then there's a cover uh, that I let them use by me, and it's the old um, necroscope piece, and oh, it's one of the old Lumley paintings. And uh, now it's apparently number two on the Amazon uh, bestsellers of horror and suspense. And number one is Stephen King. So that's not too bad. You know, um, it's not too bad knowing that. It's, it's such an unusual vampire series. And I'm shocked. It's one of the more probably it's got to be one of the most popular vampire book series that I'm shocked to this day still hasn't been made into something unless I never saw it. But I swear it's definitely never been like a Hollywood production movie or series. No, it, 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 it's been optioned. Yes, it has been. All, I have seen the options come up multiple times. You, you can research it plenty of times in like old issues of Fangoria or Starlog. There, you know, there's articles saying, oh, Necroscope's going to be turned into a thing. Yeah, and, and, and uh, it's kind of nice to see that this, that we'll be headed in that, you know, I mean, it might be, it might not be. We'll see. I mean, it's like at one point, Glenn Hetrick, who's a, uh, he's an extremely famous makeup artist, and he, he his company um, optioned it to do it. And then somebody else optioned to do it. And so they keep re-optioning things. And when I last talked to Brian, which was some years ago, Brian Lumley, he said that it was just like, oh, he said, you know, he said, they, they you know, they'll do it when they're going to do it, you know, and they, and they had one script idea ready, I guess. And boy, he, he didn't approve of the script that it was just, it kind of took everything and turned, turned it like, uh, I don't know how to explain it. It, 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 it turned it into kind of like, um, some kind of, um, uh, like mission impossible or something like that with vampires. And, and he just wasn't that thrilled with what they, the direction they would take it. But that's what they were going to do. They were going to set it in the U.S., which it's actually not set in the U.S. And, uh, you know, some, you know, so, you know, they're going to do, you know, various things like that. So it's, it's interesting to see the, it's interesting to see the past is taken and where it's gone. It, um, it was actually, I think I'm, I, I'm a hundred percent on this. It was the 2013 the first year they ever did the um, the Necronomicon, you know, the H.P. Lovecraft celebration. Yep. That I met you and the uh, writer of uh, the, the the Necroscope series. I think you guys were on a panel together. Right. Yeah. 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 That was it. Yep. Um, Stuart Gordon came to that too. That was pretty awesome. Got to meet Stuart Gordon a few years before he <laughs> passes. Yeah, that was pretty good. It was it was really good. He was like a nice guy to talk to, and I told him like we're we're talking about movie stuff and he is hearing his stories are great about you know how he like he made this and he had no money to do it and he had he made this and he had no you know this sort of thing you know and, and uh yeah full moon pictures that's what he did a lot of he did full yes moon, and the reanimator and from beyond and uh and uh, all that kind of stuff do you find it funny that a lot of your artwork, you know, it, it's 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 fantasy based, but it's very dark. Godzilla, Necroscope, and other horrific things or monsters, or like the book that we just talked about. But you've also done like really child things, like Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a weird like balance. I have the hey, one one side feeds the other. Okay, that's what I say. the The light side feeds the dark side. The dark side feeds the light side, and I it gives me a very 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 bizarre sense of humor. 
which I have, um, that some people don't understand. And, right. uh, um, and it's just sort of like, I, I, I sort of can see, I mean, like, look at Robert Rodriguez. He's a great, a good director, a big fan of his work. And he's done like the Spy Kids things, right? Right, and yeah. Also, does he does something where you know something gory and uh, you know and all this stuff and then he goes and does star wars the mandalorian you know what i mean and then it just shows that it, what it shows it shows you versatile and it, it'll keep you it's kept me solely working for 40 years almost 40 years and um you know it's 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 been a uh, that's that's something considering the life of it the average life of an illustrator is supposed to be something like um, some absurd thing, like fourteen years, fifteen years, something like that. Because the, the same can be said for uh, Eli Roth as well. Again, a guy who's made some gory, horrific horror movies, you know, Hostel and Cabin Fever, and then he he does um, the the House with the Clock in Its Walls, based on a John Belair's yeah. novel, you know, yeah. artwork by Edward Gorey, and it, it and it's you know, it wasn't the box office critical success that we wanted it to be, but it was nice to see that he could do like a child friendly kind of horror story, which which is what the John Belair's novels were have been. I've had a John Belair's uh, Widow on my show as well. Yeah, I mean, Clive Barker's the same way. He can write a kids book, you know what I mean, and yet he writes these these. I've worked with him on two books, and and he writes these other books that are like you know peeling skin and and uh you know hooks and skin and and heads and to tortured you know souls and all that and yet he'll go off and he can write like uh, something for kids and and uh it, it's sort what, of a, it, what it, stories did you do with uh barker i'm not i did not um, i did a thing called tortured souls okay yeah infernal parade and these are both he created these characters as part of a toy line way back, and then he kind of regained the rights on it and wanted to publish them, so he did some subterranean press. And so we did two books, and I got to do some monsters and some real, I mean, I, I myself got to do some pretty, pretty um, icky drawings myself, you know what I mean? And, uh, um, and, and it's just, you know, that's, it was just fun to do and uh, they're beautiful little books. They're very thin, but they're, they're really beautifully made. And, uh, it's just nice to uh, be part of that kind of thing. Um, when you're not and, drawing and painting, what are you doing? I'm uh, thinking, or I'm um, <laughs> uh, um, I'm thinking, or I'm um, you know going from one thing to another. You know what I mean? It's like I I I, need, I, I also you know I got to do you know household stuff and all that kind of uh, you know the stuff we all have to do. You know and and. And more so lately in the last couple of years than I've had to in, in, in a long time. But but I'm still, you know, doing what I do. You know what I mean? And uh, it's just, uh, but but ultimately it comes back to doing the artwork. And, and uh, right now it's been a little bit of like, a, you know, you get a little bit more tired. You just get older. You just do. And what are you... Um... What are you a collector of yourself? I mean, there are, there, are, there are millions of people that are collectors of you. And does that ever... Does that ever make you stop and think about, like, you know, just how prolific you've become? The fact that you are a collector's item. <laughs> I mean, serious, I, seriously, I, 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 I was right next I, to your table. I saw you had I, you had I, a ton of people come to your table. You know what I mean? I, I've stopped by your table. I've met you at a at a at a at a panel, but I never had a chance to sit next to somebody like you who's been in this business for so long. And just sit there and watch people come by and buy and stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, people do, and and you know, it's nice to know that that that, that I have that kind of influence in people and my in people's lives and people like what I do. You know, I do something that has a legacy to it. Uh, is that to me my legacy? You know what I mean? Is 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 them? And um, uh, I I myself I collect toys. I collect uh, a lot of monster toys um too much i think uh for the amount of space we don't have um <laughs> but that's you know life and and all that and it's just been it's it's been um um yeah it's been a, it's been a very um yeah i mean that, that's that's what i'm into but it's fun it's fun to meet collectors and fans and stuff like that so you know that's that's why i enjoy such events that i go to where i'm able to sit down and meet people and you know talk with them and so on and so on what's your um favorite toy collectible that you have one thing 
Oh, you can name a couple things depending on what it is. Like, probably, it could be like probably, a, a statue, it could be an action figure, but just like, you know, what, what's some of your favorite collectibles? Gift. Well, my favorite thing I own is a gift that was given to me by Shinichi Wakasa over in Japan. It's one of Godzilla's jaws from one of the suits. They had to take it apart. So I wow. have teeth. I have his top teeth with the with the the thing and the whole, uh, you know, the you can see sort of he signed the back of it and I kind of put it in a frame and and then, uh, you know, some other things I have are things like, uh, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. I, I did a portrait of Akira Takarada with Godzilla. And, you know, of course, he died this year. Very sad. And he uh, told he uh, signed the back of it to me. I just wanted him to sign it. Well, he writes me this letter, like telling me, like, you know, you know, oh, you know, Bob's son, you know, or, you know, and he's going on and on about stuff. And it was so personal. The letter, apparently, it's all written in beautiful calligraphy. It's all pers so personal. The interpreter was saying, I can't really interpret this. She said, this is very personal. And she said, it's sort of, a, it, it is kind of a Japanese thing where she said, we, it's, it's, it's him to you. And she said, if I interpret it, she said that kind of would lose, some, you know, I, I'm worried about it losing something, you know? So, um, but yeah, so um, um, no, I, I've got a bunch of stuff. I've got like so many things and I got a lot of books and, and stuff and, you know, really good books. I mean, I've gotten this stuff all over the years. You know, the um, you you your your artwork's grace the covers of you know hundreds of comic books. Um, but have you done an entire comic yourself? Yes, I have. I did the issue of God. Well, um, ninety ninety six. I wrote and did the pencil work for the final issue of Godzilla for Dark Horse Comics. And that was Andrew People who did the inking and he did a gorgeous job of it. And they, of course, did the coloring. And then the time came around again, almost 20 years later, in 2015, uh, IDW asked if I would want to contribute a story and illustrate a whole Godzilla book. Well, I decided I'm going to paint it this time. So I did um, 21 pages of painted artwork. And... Uh, and that came out and it did so well, it went into three printings. It was the highest selling Godzilla book they ever did. And what issue of IDW was this? Uh, number number two of Godzilla in Hell. That's it, yeah. Oh, yeah. I I, uh, I not only read the first issue of that, I definitely got to pick up the rest of the trade. Uh, yeah, it's my son and I are reading right now the uh, Godzilla versus the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers crossover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they still got the licenses. They're doing different things with things now. But uh, but back then, it was just kind of fun to do. And, uh, you know, Toho let me have some fun with it. And so, Why do you think we've never seen a Godzilla versus uh, a camera crossover? I know I, they're two different studios, oh, but I, that, I, that yeah. doesn't seem to make a lot of sense it's, that we have never seen that. Two different studios. Now, <clears throat> Dae or Katakawa Dae Pictures, they would love to do such a thing. On YouTube, if you go look for it, some fan put together the most stunning piece of computer, gen like it's animated, but it's stunning. It's Godzilla versus Gamera. And they just, it just, it's, it's just jaw-droppingly good. It's, it's, it's movie quality all the way. Dae wanted very much to do this, um, the Katakawa as they're called. They, they, even pro they even announced it. They went around saying there's going to be a Godzilla versus Gamera movie. And Toho just kind of said, no, there's not. No, 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 no. We're not, we're not going to do that. You know, so so it was all sort of like one studio saying yes, the other studio saying no. And <coughs> that's, you know, that's the way the whole cookie crumbles, you know. Yeah, it's just a shame. I mean, it's something I know fans want and... I understand the politics of movies and stuff like that. Just like fans want to see a Marvel versus DC movie. And I'm like, you're, you're nuts. <laughs> yeah. The closest you're going to get to that was that giant comic they did in the seventies of Spider-Man versus Superman. You know I mean? That, that, that close it's ever going to come because well, they, I, I don't know how much of a gamer you are, but there's always Marvel and DC happening in the game called Fortnite. Cause Fortnite has the rights to use Marvel and DC characters and right. they're teaming up and fighting against each other every five minutes. And people are like, if the video game can get the rights to all these characters and put them in a game, shooting at each other, killing each other, why can't there be like a Legos game? Or Marvel and DC just come to the table and say, we will do one thing together. And we will call every actor that we have on our Rolodex to find out, hey, you want to go fight Wolverine and 
you know, Superman and so on and so forth. I just, I understand, again, the politics, and the logistics of the payroll for that type of movie would be crazy, but, and I'm sure it's the same thing with, like, a Godzilla Gamera film. Yeah, I, the, 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 the lawyering and paperwork would be absolutely astonishing, because uh, the DIA, see, the owners of Gamera, they want to do it. They, 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 in fact, they, they went around ballyhooing this some years ago, like, announcing they're going to do all oh, this in with Toho, and we're going to do this thing, and they even did, there was even some artwork generated to it, and they put and Toho is like saying, we don't know what you're talking about. You know, we, we would not talk to you. Uh, you know, wh what are you talking about? So they were trying to think, they already think they're trying to do a fate complete, you know what I mean? Just kind of make it like, so that it would be so hyped up that Toho couldn't say no, you know what I mean? But right. uh, uh, it's it's sort of a um, uh, a fan thing and everybody would, uh, yeah, but you never know. I mean, you, you never know. It's like the way Toho is handling Godzilla now seems to be on a, uh, a, a, um, uh, a film by film basis and they're not you know uh, we were told Godzilla versus Kong uh, the latest uh, the, the last legendary film that came out was going to be it well now there's going to be the monster verse series so uh, on Apple TV so that's going to be really interesting to see and then and apparently Kong's going to be part of that at least the third thing the third thing I think you're probably so well known for besides I mean it, it you could say this is as as neck as and neck and neck as Godzilla or famous monsters of film and covers, but is probably your depictions of Cthulhu and Lovecraftian monsters. Yeah, um, I've gotten a lot of good um, feedback on that. I, I just sort of started doing it, and the underlying thing of all of this stuff is, is that it's, it's mythical lore. It's a it's a it's like old um, old mythology of monsters and giant, uh, you know all kinds of stuff. And, um, and it, it, you know, if you go back and that's why I love it. That's why I love that whole, that's why I like dragons and all that kind of stuff, because they're all part of a myth making kind of thing, you know? And that's what gets me excited about those things. And, and, uh, that's why, you know, I'm into giant monsters. You say, what, what do you like with these giant kaiju monsters? Cause they're mysterious and they come from some realm that we don't know about and, you know, so on and so on, you know what I mean? I remember that panel that you did um, back again, back to no Necronomicon in 2013, which is God is going to be like nine years ago as of the one coming up this August. And they were talking about, there was some writer on the panel with you guys talking about how like the caverns below uh, Providence were built in a way that they should never have been built except for to have like something as big as Cthulhu walk through them and very right. conspiracy theory like conversation. I remember that. I remember that yeah. Cause there was all kinds of, you know, there's all kinds of like, you, you know, there's all kinds of ideas and you get all people putting forward all kinds of weird stuff. So, yeah, it's it's it. You never know. You know, what I mean, it's it's kind of fun. to. It's a fun. It's a fun thing. It's like when you hear stories like that, you go, the movie starts here. You know what I mean? And so, uh, you know, yeah. When, uh, what do you got coming up? Uh, do you have any more famous sponsors of film and covers or no, covers? It's sort of gone under. They're not they're no longer in business anymore. Again. Want, Wait, again. Yeah, they're they went under uh, in 2019. Uh, Phil Phil Kim just folded it up because what? Oh, it was a long story. It wasn't selling too well, and then there was some problems with um, all of these. The problem is when they do these properties inside of the magazine, like you know, back in the days, the glory days of famous watch, the 1970s, the studios either didn't care or they saw it as like, hey, this is free publicity, you know, whatever, you know, this is great. Right now, you have like all these studios made these monster movies, and they all want their little dosh out of it. They want their money now out of it. And uh, you know, th there was some problems they had finally had in the end with Toho Pictures, and um, and so he kind of folded it up, called it a day on it. But um, I'm illustrating King Kong, the original novel by Dallas Lovelace right now. I'm doing a big, beautiful. It's going to be a gorgeous three hundred dollar book. It's going to be like slipcase wow. here is. That'll be coming out next year in the anniversary of Kong. And I'm also doing something else for Kong. Um, and that's going to be coming out in the UK. And it's going to be sort of uh, the, the uh, Edgar Wallace script, the original script before he met Miriam C. Cooper. And so Stephen Jones is sort of editing and putting this together. And I'm, I'm real excited about it. And uh, it, they're using a cover art piece that I'd already done. And also... 
I supplied some the black and white interiors for the inside of it too. So so it's going to be a nice it's going to be a nice couple of Kong things coming out next year that I'm involved with, and uh, I got I got other things I'm doing on too. You know, my wife and I she's written a mammoth a book about mammoths and woolly mammoths, and it's a fictional sort of book. And and uh, I'm going to be doing the, we're going to pitching that as we get a pretty good i pretty good chance of selling this to this publisher that we work we've worked with before and it's going to be sort of a a, a, a story aimed at like uh younger kids as we have on mammoths so interesting the uh it's um you know, th there's the creature that you don't see or hear too much about uh, being done. I know there was like a woolly mammoth kind of titan showing up in the Godzilla King of the, the Monsters. Hemoth, yeah, the Hemoth, yeah. Yeah, he's, the Hemoth. And, uh, and he's, everybody's, he's everybody's favorite one. You know what I mean? Like outside of Godzilla, he's everybody's favorite. Uh, you know, he got this huge applause in an audience I saw it with. You know, so it's like because he's and, – and people want to see that come back. They want to see that come back, you know, and, and – uh, one company even released as a licensed figure and all kinds of stuff. So people are excited by that one. Definitely. Yeah. Well, Bob, uh, where are you going to be at a convention coming up? I'm going to be at um, G Fest in Chicago. And then I'm going to be at Necronomicon in Providence. Can't wait to see you there. Yeah, I'll have a table. I'll have a table in the dealer's room this time. So uh, fantastic. Be, I'll be having prints like I did. And then I'll be at. Um, the All Monsters Attack Expo in Indiana, which is going to be in September. And uh, so, yeah, I'll be there. And um, then eventually, hopefully we'll, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see where I go. We'll see where I go from there. It's going to be October shaping up to be a busy month. I, uh, I'd like to get back to Monster Expo if it's not the IllixCon weekend. Um, and it might just be, I don't know. But if it's not that, it would be nice to come back to that. So. Fantastic, dude. Well, thank you so right. much for coming on the show to talk about your prolific yep. career, what you got going on, and just answer you, great questions that uh, we could come up with about your your art style. It's just it's something completely different, and you don't see it. Like even uh, with a lot, you know, there's the art world is so competitive, but you still have a very distinguished like fantasy style that people can like point out your artwork immediately. Yeah. I mean, that's what I've been told. They so they can look at that's a Bob Eggleton, you know, like it's even been mistaken for something of mine. Somebody's insisting that's yours. And I go, no, it's not. It's not, you know, like that. And uh, that's kind of a fun thing to have to kind of deal with, too, is that people like saying, oh, you know, that's yours. And I said, no, it's not. <laughs> so, but it's nice um, to be part of all of this. So it's good. Definitely, definitely.